So before we continue with monad algebras, um, <clears throat> I wanted to go over um, this idea of horizontal composition of natural transformations. Um, because we will, we will have to use this um, horizontal composition when we are dealing with algebras and monads. So with monads, we can sort of like write the high level language for monads using just uh, natural transformations and equalities between different combinations of natural transformations, right? The unit and the multiplication for the monad. Uh, but with algebras, uh, as you remember, algebras uh, focus on a particular object. So for every object, there's a different algebra, potentially. Right? So, algebras are not like natural transformations. Uh, so, when we want to make a connection between monads and algebras, we'll have to make a connection between a particular algebra and a particular component of a natural transformation. So, we will have to deal with components of natural transformations. And these string diagrams, they are very nice and uh, high level language to talk about composing natural transformations, but they are not very obvious how to translate this into components. So in particular, you remember we talked about uh, horizontal composition of natural transformations, and, and there was this case uh, that's called whiskering, when you combine a natural transformation with a functor, which really means combining horizontally natural transformation with an identity natural transformation on a particular factor. So let's, let's have a look at this. Suppose that we have this string diagram where we have um, a natural transformation alpha here, and, uh, and this is some functor f, and this is some functor g, and the natural transformation goes from g to some g prime. Okay. So we are dealing with the simplified case of horizontal composition where we say, well, this is sort of implied um, natural transformation from F to back to F, which is an identity natural transformation. So we are horizontally composing this. <clears throat> and the other thing is that I would like you to be able to like juggle these different languages. So like if you can't do something with string diagrams, well go to the regular diagrams. If you can't do something with regular diagrams, go to components and write algebraic equations. Right? But you have to be like uh, able to switch between these pictures and use the, the most appropriate one, the simplest one. I mean in principle there is a way of dealing with components using uh, string diagrams because components or uh, particular um, objects. Here we are dealing with functors and natural transformations, but we would have to, if in components, deal with objects. Uh, an object really can be thought of as a functor as well. It's a functor from a very special category that only has one object. Any functor from a singleton category picks an object in another category, right? Just like uh, in sets, you know, a, 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 f a function from a singleton set picks an object in some other set. <coughs> so theoretically, it's possible. It's, there, there are some papers in which people use this language. Um, <coughs> but this might be simpler. <coughs> so if you want to go to components, let's translate this picture into um, a regular diagram. So we have three categories, right? So, so this is a category C, this is category D, and let's say this is category E, right? Functor F goes from C to D. So in a regular diagram, we would put a, a, a dot for a, a category and an arrow for a functor, right? So C goes from, uh, F goes from C to D, Right? And then we have two functors, g and g prime. So we, we draw them like this. 
this is functor G, this is functor G prime, this is our category E here, and the natural transformation alpha goes here. Right? So it's the same picture, sort of. But from this picture now, we can think about, OK, what does it mean? Aha, and by the way, this is why this is called whiskering, when you are combining a natural transformation with a functor, because this sort of looks like a whisker. <laughs> you can even have more things, like you have, have, can have another whisker on this side and so on. Um, so what does it mean? So we take an element, an object here in C, right? Now F will bring it to, uh, so, so I'll use this notation saying this, now I'm working with components, not the uh, functors. So this is, this I'm taking A and A is, goes into FA. Right, and this is another category D, right? So here I have a category C, I have a category D. This FA can go two ways now. It can go through G FA, right? Or it could go to G prime FA, right? And the natural transformation is a family of morphisms between these two. Well, be, this is for a particular object, so this is a component of natural transformation, is just a morphism alpha A. So this component of alpha at A. Right? No, this is actually alpha at FA, right? Because it takes FA. Okay. All right. So that's important. Alpha F at FA. Because so I started with an object FA, so the component that I get, alpha is a transformation between G and G prime. Right? But my object, I can call this object B, right? If I call this object B, then you see that this is G prime B and this is GB. Right? And this is a natural transformation alpha at B. But B is FA. Okay? Clear? Um, okay. But on the other hand, this whole thing is a component of this natural transformation that's a horizontal composition of these two. So this is a horizontal composition of alpha after f. That's a natural transformation that goes directly from G after F to G prime after F, right? So I have a natural transformation that goes from between these two, and I'm calculating its component at A. That's what I was doing, right? So a com the component at A of this composition is equal to alpha at FA. Okay? See? I mean, this, this is just using the definitions. This is how the, the composition is defined, horizontal composition, right? And I have just calculated the component of this composition at some object A. And it gave me this. And I used, well, I used uh, this component, alpha FA, of my alpha to define. So horizontal or whiskering with, with, with a functor on the right sort of means taking the natural transformation but shifting its uh, argument, its uh, point. Right? So I'm shifting it by F. So it's like, it's the same natural transformation, but shifted by F. Okay? Now we need, so, so this is my, this is what we have to remember. And now I want to do the, uh, the other way around. Okay? So 
let, let's say this is f and this is alpha. So I'm whiskering on the other side, okay? This is slightly different, okay? Because what's the picture there? Uh, so this is g, this is g prime, okay? So we start in, in the category c, we get g prime here, and we get g here, and this is our alpha. But now we are continuing with f here. So the whisker is on the left. So this is category D, this is category E. Right? So how do we do this? Well, we, we start, we want to calculate the component of this composite natural transformation at A. So we pick an object A here. And what happens to this A? What happens to this A is that it can be uh, mapped using G prime. Okay, where should we? Oh, let me let me write it here. So we have A, G prime A, and we have G A. Right? So I'm splitting this one object using G prime and G. This is G. Now the natural transformation alpha, its component at A, alpha A is this morphism. Now I'm applying F to it. So I get F of G prime A and here I'm getting F of G A. Okay? So what is the component of this natural transformation? Well, I just lift my alpha A, this morphism, using the functor F, right? So this is lifted by F, I lift alpha A. That's how this is defined, the, the horizontal composition is defined this way. In this particular case, it simplifies to this, right? There is no other possibility, right? I mean, what else can I do? I mean, I have alpha A here. I want to find a morphism from G, FGA to FG prime A. Well, I have to use alpha A to go from GA to GA prime to G prime A, but it's under F, so I have to lift my morphism using F. F is a functor, so I can lift morphisms, right? So, what I have calculated is F after alpha component at A, right? This is my calculation, and I found out that this is equal to F acting on alpha A. So, it's not really symmetric, right? You see? So, when, when, when you are whiskering on the right, you're just shifting your, uh, your alpha, when you're whiskering on the left, you are lifting your alpha. That's the difference. Okay? So remember this. This is, this is an important thing. Because when we have to like, switch between these languages, we'll have to use these formulas. Okay? So now let's go back to what we were talking about last time. Last time we talked about uh, monad algebras, right? So uh, <coughs> in general, we have for every functor we have a category of algebras for this functor, and the category of algebras for this functor consists of these pairs. When we pick an object, it's called a carrier, right? And uh, pick a morphism, and this morphism has to go from F A to A, where F is the functor. So for any func endo functor, okay, it has to be an endo functor because you have to have a morphism from F A to A, which means F A has to be in the same category as A, right? That's why algebras are always defined for endo functors. But that's great because more monads are also endo functors. 
and we are trying to make this connection. Right? <coughs> so these guys are uh, called algebras, right? Pick an object and pick a morphism like this. Uh, there are morphisms between them, so we have a category of algebras in which these are objects, and morphisms between these guys, and this is very important. Uh, so if you have one algebra like this and another like this, for the same functor, okay, these two morphisms have nothing to do with each other, okay? This is not like natural transformations, you know, when you just kind of kind of, you know, they have to be related in, in any way. No. This, this could be int, this could be boolean, right? This is a morphism from, a, let's say, a list of int to int. This is a morphism from list of bool to bool. They can be completely different. They can be defined completely separately, you know, it's like, well, pick the second element of the list. Oh, if the list is empty, then just pick zero, right? For an integer, right? Integers have zero, right? If it's some other type, it doesn't have a zero, so you would have to come up with some other prescription, right? So what's, what's a um, morphism between these two algebras? Well, we, we have to have a mapping from A to B to begin with, right? <clears throat> but it has to be coherent. It has to like preserve uh, the evaluator. This is an evaluator for A. This is an evaluator for B. So an evaluator for A goes from FA to A. That's, that's our sigma, right? The evaluator uh, for B goes from FB to B, and that's the lambda, right? But because F is a functor, we can lift this function, this sorry, morphism, right, to FF, right? And now we have two ways of going over this diagram, right? <clears throat> and they better be equal. What does it mean that they are equal? It means that, the, that the, the, this evaluation is preserved when you transform one algebra to another algebra, meaning that you can first evaluate and then you can transform the result using F. Or you can first transform this FA to FB and then use the other evaluator to get a B. And you should get the same result. Right? That means preservation of evaluation. Right? <clears throat> so these kind of Fs that make this diagram commute, these are morphisms in the category of algebras, which we call algef. Okay, for the functor f. That's the sound. Now we have something else. We also have a monad. And the monad is <coughs> consists of a, an endofunctor, which we'll now call T, right? Here we call it F, here we'll call it T. Don't get confused with this. Uh, <coughs> and it has a natural transformation eta that goes from, <clears throat> and I'll write a component of it, okay? I'll write it in components. So, eta goes from identity, well, identity functor to t, right? In components, it means if I evaluate it at a, identity on a gives me a, and this gives me ta, right? And there's another natural transformation called mu, which I will also evaluate at A, and it goes from T, T, A, to T, A, right? So this is the, what people call flatten in other languages, or, or join in Haskell, right? So, so this, is, this is our return, and this is our join, okay? Now, among all these algebras, there are algebras that are compatible with a monad. So we can, we can now replace f with t, right? Because, hey, this is an endofunctor also. So let's say alg t, right? I'll replace all the f's with t's. Uh, 
I can do that, right? And now I have an endofunctor T, which happens to be a monad, uh, and I can define algebras for this endofunctor, and I'm fine, right? But I want to have algebras that are compatible with the monad. What does it mean? It means that uh, if, if, you, if you, the intuition is this, um, eta takes a value of type A, right, and encapsulates it. So it's hiding this value in some way. And, and by encapsulation, we can think of, oh, it generates an expression with this value, right? So it's like the simplest expression that you can generate, or, or the simplest term that you generate using this functor, right? And now you have algebras that do the opposite. They take an expression, right, and evaluate it down to a value. So what if we combine these two, right? What if we take eta a, right, and combine it with our sigma? So we have created a trivial expression which contains one value, and now we evaluate it. What value should we get? We should get back the same value, right? Now, in general, this is not true. So we have to impose this as a special condition, right? So this should be an identity of A. <clears throat> so we impose this condition, and this, this, this is one of these co coherence conditions, that picks only some algebras. Not every algebra satisfies this. Um, let me give you an example of an algebra that does not satisfy it. Um, let's say uh, for for the list functor, we'll, we'll use list functor as as a, in, uh, as a standard example. For a list functor, eta um, creates a singleton list. So let's say we pick. Uh, as our carrier will pick integers, okay? So, uh, so eta takes an integer and creates a singleton with this integer inside. So it, it's a singleton list with an integer, right? So it's like a list that contains, let's say, 42, right? Okay? And now I'm saying, well, my sigma should evaluate this to 42. But, but I can define an, an arbitrary sigma for integers. I can say, well, it just picks um, a third element of a list or zero otherwise, right? Length. Or length of the list. Because it's completely arbitrary. An algebra can do whatever it wants, right? as long as it's defined for all, all possible values of this particular type, right? So, it, yeah, length, for instance. So, so sigma on, on a singleton, if this is length, it will produce 1, not 42. So that's not a good algebra. I mean, it's a good algebra in general, but not a monad algebra for the list monad, okay? So out of all these m many possible algebras, this condition picks some specific algebras. <clears throat> there is another condition <coughs> that says um, if I have a sort of double encapsulation, right? There are two ways for me to evaluate this. One way to evaluate this is to use mu a, right? Mu a goes from TTA to TA. Once I have TA, I can apply my sigma to get an A, right? But there is another way of doing this. I can use sigma to go under the T and evaluate these sub-expressions, right? I can lift my sigma. 
So I can use T sigma, right? And T sigma will evaluate the sub-expressions and then and will produce a TA. And then I can apply sigma again, right? Okay? And I want this to commute as well. Going with the list example, right? It means I have a list of lists. Mu for, a, for, a, for the list um, monad is concatenation. So I can take a list of lists and I can concatenate it first and then evaluate. Or I could say I'll evaluate the sublists to numbers, right? So I'll get a list of numbers and then evaluate this list. And I get it. These two ways better give me the same result. So these two conditions, right? Okay, so let me write this condition. So it's sigma after mu a must be equal to sigma after t sigma. Okay? So these are two coherence conditions that say the algebra sigma or the algebra A sigma, right, is compatible with my monad. All right? Let's take a break now.